<laughs> so, um, so welcome to F34 PPP, the Politics, Perception and Philosophy of Physics, which is co-convened by myself and Omar over here. It is actually really good to see so many of you here. Um, it's going to be a very different module. It's not going to be about me presenting material and you painstakingly writing it down and then regurgitating it in any form. It's really about debate and discussion and challenging you a little bit or a lot and getting you to really think, instead of thinking of this in terms of I do the material, I do the exam, I do the questions, I do the coursework and there being a very rigid structure to this, it's going to be hopefully a little bit more, more free form than that. So if I'm putting some of you off, it's okay, it's good for you to learn that now. I also will stress again, as I said in the fourth year induction thing, in case some of you weren't there, if you don't like writing, this is not the module for you. And actually in previous years we've had three pieces of coursework for reasons um, related to your um, workload and not entirely unrelated to our workload as well. We now have two pieces of coursework, one which is 30% um, and one which is 70%. I'll get onto those soon. Um, I'm going to hopefully lecture capture each of these. We'll see how well this first one works. We're in this room for the, the, the remainder of the semester, so let's see how it works. And obviously at any time, stick your hand up or attract my attention or throw something at me and I'll try and address questions. From week four onwards, the floor will be opened up to you quite a bit. So today, with that challenging title, Science Proves Nothing, I will explain. I'm going to cover what we'll cover in the module. Timetable and assessment. Observation and facts, and I've got facts in scare quotes with a question mark because how do we define a scientific fact? When does it become a fact? It's actually quite a challenging aspect of science is when do we accept something into the scientific literature and is everything published in the scientific literature correct? It most definitely isn't. Um, this I'll probably certainly get onto this and I'll get onto this. This probably will be next week, but we'll see. We'll see. So, this is the layout. First two weeks, this week and next week, we're going to have a pretty well a standard lecture format. I'm laying out, laying out some of the, 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 the processes. Unfortunately, I'm not here on October the I'll be there. So what I'll do is I'll upload a video lecture and I'll also do an associated blog post. So October the 14th, we're not here. Then, from then on, we've got as it says, seminar and discussion. So there'll be 20 minutes or so from me, and then we'll open it out to the floor. And I have been very, very impressed in previous years. The first time we did this, this is now, I think, the fifth year of PPP. The first year, I got to this point, and I thought, well, it's going to be tumbleweed. And the first time tentatively went up, and then an hour and a half later, I was saying, right, OK, we've got to stop now. And it got into a lot of to and fro and a lot of debate and discussion. And that's what I, want to, what I want to say. I know that's difficult, but it really did seem like the floodgates opened at one point where lots of people were, I wanted to shout about this for the last three years. <laughs> and if you read some of the, um, the comments in the feedback, which I've put on the Moodle page, you'll see that as well. There's a lot of opportunity for you to contribute. And that we want to hear from you. And as I've said before, every time I leave one of these PPP sessions when there's a lot of student engagement, I go away and my thinking's just changed slightly. And that, can only be a good thing. Um, so we'll cover peer review, we'll cover something called the science wars, which is about sociology versus science. I've got to stress that I know many physicists get very, very sniffy indeed about sociology and in inverted commas, the soft sciences. First of all, there's a whole area called social physics now, which is pretty quantitative and does really neat things like taking statistical physics mod models like the icing model, which is used to look at magnetism and map that onto crowd and social dynamics. So it's a very rigorous, very interesting and very compelling area of study. But even outside of social physics, sociologists, yes, there is some nonsense in the sociology literature. There's also a lot of very good stuff in the sociology literature, which we'll come to. A um, little bit about politics and science. This in particular, I really want to focus on this time around, the depth of expertise, where everybody's an expert. And in fact, in many cases, 
coming from an academic background or having some demonstrable expertise or qualification in something often is seen as elitist and something to be avoided. That you're part of the establishment and therefore, well, you know, you've seen it with Brexit. We had Michael Gove tell us we've heard enough of experts. And I'll show you some aspects of that actually in this, this lecture as well. Um, also about this one on communication breakdown is how do we communicate science? Not just to our peers, to our peers of course, but beyond audiences of non-scientists. Then we have two invited speakers. And I should have those on the next couple of slides. Yeah, so Harry Collins here, whose books I thoroughly recommend. He's written about, I don't know, 100 or so it seems. But these three in particular, are we all scientific experts now? This one, so I read this a couple of months back. Harry is a fascinating character. He was embedded, I think is the best word, as a sociologist in the legal team. So he's been overseeing gravitational wave research, not just for the last few years, for the last 43 years. And this book is all about the run-up to the, obviously, the incredibly exciting uh, announcement of that incredibly strong gravitational wave signal a couple of years ago. What's really interesting is Harry doesn't have a first degree in physics. I think the last time he did physics was A-level. And he was embedded in that community to the extent, I'm sure he'll tell you about this, where there was a spot the physicist game set up whereby there were 10, I think, gravitational wave questions, or questions on gravitational wave physics in terms of how would you set up an interferometer, or what can this interferometer measure, or what would be the form of this signal. And they asked a number of gravitational wave physicists, they asked a number of non-gravitational wave physicists, and they asked Harry. And in the end, they couldn't spot Harry. When, that, when those answers were given to other physicists and said, spot the sociologist, they couldn't spot Harry. So it's an interesting insight into what we mean by knowledge, or tacit knowledge, or expertise, or what are our qualifications to discuss aspects of physics. So I'd recommend his website. As you can see, he's um, very much focused on <laughs> the idea of what is knowledge, what is expertise. And then the following week, we'll have uh, Cameron Lumsden, who's recently moved here from uh, Leicester, because he's a criminologist and sociologist Research on policing, victims, digital media. So particularly with regard to um, online interactions, and sometimes this could be quite a challenging um, session, I think. Sometimes those online interactions tip over into abuse, of course, as you know. And we're going to hear about how, again, in terms of if we can't use the scientific facts to sway people, what do we do? And at what point do we continue to argue? And I hope none of you are quite as argumentative as me, but I'm sure you've all seen that XKCD cartoon where there's somebody typing away on the, the keyboard and then there's a speech bubble off and it says, are you coming to bed yet? No, I'm not coming yet. There's somebody wrong on the internet. All right? That was me. I'm sure that's not you, but there's a question of when do you argue, when do you try to put your point across, and when do you stand back, and um, Karen will go into a lot of the aspects of online debate and interaction. In terms of the recommended reading, as well as Harry's and Karen's stuff, um, these are three key texts. This is a great little, oh, I was going to bring it over. This philosophy of science is in the Oxford University Press. Um, uh, series. It's one of those little handbooks. Normally, you go into most bookshops, you'll see a whole stack of these, or a whole uh, display of these right at the front. It's a great little book. Gives the the essence of um, what so science is all about, or what the philosophy of science is all about. This is a slightly more technical. What is this thing called science? Slightly more technical intro. This I really recommend. James actually came and gave us an invited seminar a few years back. James is a philosopher, but his background was in maths, and in particular, he did a lot of his um, maths degree, as a lot of our mathematicians do, on um, things like quantum field theory and the, the more mathematical side of physics. So he speaks like a physicist, and he thinks like a physicist. And in terms of the philosophy of science, this is a really readable book as well. A lot of philosophers, and it's got to be said, sociologists tend to write in a very flowery, verbose, 
style where substance comes or style comes over substance. James's stuff isn't like that. This is a, a really good and very readable introduction. Okay, and there's a whole on the F34PPP um, website, there's a whole range of other additional resources, including this wonderful site. It's an entire course, a real course called Bullshit, or Calling Bullshit, on um, different methods of getting pure nonsense out there and making that nonsense sound and look very compelling. Okay. So, in terms of the assessment, two things. Physics world type article. And when I say physics world type article, I've had this one up in the past before Omar and I get the questions later on. I don't mean it has to be laid out in exactly the three column style. I mean in the in terms of the overall um, structure, in terms of the overall um, style of the arguments, rather than the actual formatting or typesetting on the page. Somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 words, and that's got a deadline of November the 15th. And then, brought this deadline forward a little bit. We used to have this after January, I think, maybe if we have it this year before, just get it out of the way for everybody. I think it's better by the end of the calendar year, at least. And that's in the style of a broadsheet article. So like an article in The Observer or The Times, that type of um, article. Even The Telegraph will even allow something along the lines of The Telegraph. Um, but something which is written for a broad audience, not just scientists or physicists, whereas this, obviously, you can get away with being a little bit more focused on the physics side. There's a range of physics world articles, includes, including some written by um, previous students of, of PPP, available on the uh, both on the Moodle page and on the f34ppp.com website. Okay, so there's a range of different blog topics. Key thing is you can choose your own. And most years, the majority of students choose their own topic. You don't have car blanche. It has to be related somehow to the themes of PPP. But if you want to get an idea of some of the topics that have um, been uh, written about before, see the f34ppp.com website. There's a whole, probably approaching 150, something like that, examples of previous work. What we, what I, sorry, what we ask you to do is just if you've got an idea for a topic that hasn't been used before, come along and chat with either Omar and I and um, just so we can make sure it does fall within the remit of the module. Any questions thus far? Maybe one other quick point. Thanks, uh, you have to write two articles. They have to be on distinctly separate topics. Yeah. There are a few cases last year where the first article was just a little bit too close to the second article, maybe both on ethics and medical physics or whatever it might be. They have to be distinctly separate topics for obvious reasons. You want to go away and do separate research for the second article. Yeah. Good point. Any other questions? Okay. So there are some suggested also it says blog post topics it's just, um, left over from last year but in terms of article topics this would also work should scientists have to justify the research in terms of its socio-economic impact do social media have a, play to, a role to play in the scientific process in terms of peer review when should scientists go public with the results will CERN write to several links with Alessandro Strumi and you don't know who Al if you don't know who Alessandro Strumi is try looking his name up you'll get lots of links is many worlds multiverse theory science can science be crowdfunded? Is peer review working? Should universities cut back on funding of PhD positions? And is good old Richard closed minded? So, wide range of topics. You get the idea. And when I say send me, I mean, you can also send Omar, of course, as well. Very happy if you want to send Omar the emails. <laughs> Sorry. Feels the best of the day, I believe. So as I said, if you go to the f34ppp.com website, you'll find it's a little bit hidden away. It's three. It's a WordPress site, and if you look in the top right-hand corner, there are three horizontal bars. Click on that, and you'll pull up a number of different archives of blog posts from a number of different years. And so as you can see, people have written on science and science fiction, and you'll see a whole wide range of different topics. OK. I mean, Got all that preparatory stuff out of the way. I'll, I'll start on the sort of key theme. Absolutely no questions. Good. 
So, key thing is, how is scientific knowledge different from other forms of knowledge, or indeed expertise? Or what distinguishes astronomy from astrology, say? Can we define the scientific method? Is there a scientific method? Does everybody do science exactly the same way? Is there an archetypal scientific method that we all follow? You know, if somebody does an experiment in Japan and we repeat it over here, we do our best to repeat their measurements. We do our best to, to set everything up just as they did, but do we do it in precisely the same way? In fact, what you're gonna find, and I hope you'll be shocked by, is that there's a heck of a lot less reproducibility or reproducing of previous experiments in science. The received wisdom is that a result is produced and then everybody rushes to try to reproduce that result. There's absolutely no kudos in science. What well, kudos is there in reproducing science somebody else has already done? You want the high profile papers, you want the news headlines, you want to be the first to do something. More importantly, the journals and those who fund you want you to be the first. Why should you bother repeating somebody else's experiment? Where's the fame and glory in that? So that's the first thing, we'll talk about that. Knowledge is power, of course. But there are some things I want to get that we'll come back to, but I just want to touch on right now. Is sometimes, and certainly from a government perspective or a funding body perspective, science is seen to be a driver of technology, and therefore what we should aim for are applications. So why would you ever do the research unless there's an application stemming from it? That's a gross sort of, um, I guess, overstatement, but you know, there is that undercurrent in many cases in terms of what is your impact going to be? How are you going to impact on society? Because we're publicly funded, that's still an important question we should address. But our only impact on society is not just the technology we produce. Many would think knowledge itself is a, as a public good is something that is good for society. But is all knowledge good for society? And then we end up with ethics questions. These are the type of things we're going to explore. What I want to focus on is where I was when I was finally your undergraduate as well, that science is this wonderfully rational, objective thing. And it's very different from other forms of activity, which are you know biased and subjective. But the great thing about science is it's got this, underworld, this underpinning um, objectivity. So this is from Ladyman. Rightly or wrongly, science is often thought to be the ultimate form of objective and rational inquiry. And scientists are widely regarded as being able to gather and interpret evidence and use it to arrive at conclusions that are scientifically proven. I really hate that term. The idea that science proves something. The idea that things are scientifically proven. And so not just the product of ideology or prejudice. And of course we aim for that. I'm not saying we don't aim for that. That's what we all want to do. But the idea that science is driven forward relentlessly by pure objective examination and exploration and no biases play into it or no social dynamics play into it, I'll show you many examples of where it's not as um, neat and simple as that might suggest. And you know, this is not some newfangled sort of social <coughs> justice definition of science this is, you know, this is Feynman, the physicist physicist, quite some time ago. It is imperative, back in the 70s, it is imperative in science to doubt. It's absolutely necessary for progress in science to have uncertainty as a fundamental part of your inner nature. We bombard you with errors and error analysis in first year labs for exactly this reason. There are always uncertainties. To make progress in understanding, we must remain modest and allow that we do not know. Nothing is certain or proved beyond all doubt. And if that's causing you a little bit of uncomfort or discomfort, good. But that's, this is absolutely key. This is a wonderful article. I don't know if any of you have read Carlo Rovelli's stuff, Carlo Rovelli's books. You really should. He's a really, really good writer. Um, there's, what's it called, seven... Seven pieces of physics or something. I forget the title. It's, it's where well, he takes seven key ideas in physics and runs through them in a very pithy but very um, punchy way. This is a, a wonderful um, 
uh, interview with him from, I can't remember when it was, Wired magazine or something, um, some time ago. Science is not about certainty, a philosophy of physics. And um, in that, he makes effectively the same points that um, Feynman makes about we don't have this absolute certainty. We, ha you know, we have a model, and we see our experimental data fits that model. But, for example, I could take the same set of experimental data, same type of measurements, same graphs, even the same spectrum, get five or six different sci scientists or research groups around the table, give them exactly the same data, and I'm certain I'll get a number, quite a number of different interpretations of that data. So which is the truth? And whose truth is better than others' truth? And how do we define it? On the level of expertise, who do we define who's got the, you know, the, the highest level of truth? XKCD will feature a lot in this module, a lot. So, Professor, that man claims the Earth is 6,000 years old. So, just use your head and don't concern yourself over much with what other people think. Scientists, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts, except it's not. But he says the fossils in the mountains were put there in a flood. Well, evidence suggests that, the, that they were not. But he, a million people can call the mountains a fiction, yet it need not trouble you as you stand atop them. So it's obviously about evidence and the importance of evidence. And that's obviously key. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts, or received wisdom. But he believes the silliest things. So the universe doesn't care what you believe, true. The wonderful thing about science is that it doesn't ask for your faith, it just asks for your eyes. <laughs> this is uh, even more worrying compared to when this was uploaded a number of years ago. Science is derived from the facts, and that's Chalmers, page one, but the problem is this. What are the facts, and can we trust our eyes? Can we believe our eyes? There are many, many different issues here with, in terms of what is good, rigorous, robust data? And what is a good, rigorous, robust model or interpretation of that data? All right, good enough. You've probably seen this one, yeah? Just a show of hands. Yeah. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's quite neat. So here's A and B. A, quite clearly, is much, much darker than B in contrast. But actually, if we get rid of the surrounding image and just black it off like that, they're exactly the same contrast. So, you know this. Sometimes, you know, your eyes are not the, are very easily fooled and your brain is very easily fooled. So we have to be careful in terms of how we eyeball data, but we know this. Then we go to the next step. We use sensors and we use calibrated instruments to try and get away from the influence of the sensors. But at some point, at least until our, our AI overlords take over completely, a human is interpreting that data. You've seen this one. I used to use this um, open for open days at one point. This, I think, is for something like uh, 300 in B1. So a reasonably good statistic. And as I repeated it for large and smaller groups, it's sort of along those lines. So it's, a, it's an old one, but it's a goodie. And the thing that really worries me, well, first of all, I'm in this this class, how many, how many of you see um, white and gold? Yeah, okay, look at that, about a fifth, about a fifth. Okay, so I'm in that class as well. Now the thing that really worries me is two aspects about this, is that you and I, somebody who sees black and blue can look at that, at exactly the same image, under exactly the same experimental conditions, or environmental conditions, and see something different. That's the first thing, that's worrying. The second thing, and perhaps even more worrying, is that one part of my brain knows damn well that it's black and blue. Because you can just load it into Photoshop or GIMP or whatever image processing tool you like and go, what are the RGB values here? And you, there's one part of my brain knows exactly that it's this, but that part of my brain doesn't communicate with the other part of the brain that is screaming at me that it's white and gold. So. So what you'll hear. Oh, well that's good, it automatically started. Um, and can we trust our ears? Now, this is a really, really good one. This is um, about how your understanding or your interpretation <laughs> is modified in the um, presence or when you get additional information. 
And that's part of something called Bayesian probabilities and Bayesian statistics. Have you heard of Bayesian statistics? Show of hands. Oh, good. Well, that's more than in previous years. Good. For those of you who haven't, don't worry. I hadn't heard of Bayesian statistics until I was, did a, uh, was a postgraduate or maybe in a postdoc. It's a different way of thinking about statistics. And it's all about modifying your belief or modifying your, yeah, your interpretation or your belief in the light of new evidence. This is a really good example, not in terms of what you see, but what you hear. Let's see if it works this time. So what you'll hear is a sentence, a spoken sentence, that's been transformed by a computer to sound like gibberish. So, <laughs> any idea what they said? No. OK. Uh, you can hear it one more time. OK, now we'll hear the real sentence. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. Does it make sense? Good, isn't it? Yeah, wait, was that the same? It was the exact same sentence that you heard the first time. No way. <laughs> it's the exact same sentence. Your brain is always using prior information to make sense of new information coming in. So. Once you know what the sentence is, when you go back and hear the distorted version, you can apply that information and it makes sense. I hear it now, and every time I hear it, it's wired into my neurons. So I hear it even the first time, and the last time I listened to it was a year ago, it's wired in there. I guess it depends on your memory, etc. But that can be a good thing, and that it gives you an extra piece of, of information. The problem is when you couple that. Um, relying on making your judgments on the basis of prior information with the fact that we are pattern seekers, that's what we're very good at, is searching out patterns. Those two things can get confused and you can see patterns where there are no patterns. And that's a bad place to be as a scientist. That's the quote from there. Your brain is always making use of prior information to make sense of new information coming in. There's a, I'll refer again to this. There's a wonderful article by John Butterworth, who's a particle physicist at UC. It's UCL, isn't it? Yeah. I think so. Um, uh, Guardian article from a number of years back, actually five years back. Belief, bias, and Bayes. And um, it tells you all about Bayes' theorem. And as you can see, evidence can modify our beliefs, but the impact of that depends on those beliefs. An 18th century priest, Bayes, has something to say about that and what could be seen as a mathematical formulation of the scientific method. Well worth a read. Okay. So, what we have tried to do over the last three years, and you know you want to do this as well, is to be as objective as you can be. This is when, in your terms of the experiments you do, in terms of the third year project you did or are about to do, we want you to you take that data and to try and step back, put your biases to one side, and you might really, really, really want this data to have a result, have a particular result that might be the you know the cornerstone of your project, but you've got to try and put that to one side and be as objective and analytic as you can be. This is, the thing is, it would be great to say that all of us are capable of doing that to the nth degree, but it does depend on where you're coming from. And it does depend on the prior information you've had and it does depend on your biases. So this is from, uh, as you can see, Committee on the Conduct of Science, National Academy of Sciences. This is back 30 years ago in 1989. A few quotes from that are well worth um, pointing out. The first is from, they in turn quote Peter Medawar, The Art of the Soluble, which is another great book you should read. Scientists are people of very dissimilar temperaments doing different things in very different ways. Among scientists are collectors, classifiers, and compulsive tidy uppers. They're known as particle physicists. Um, many are detectives by temperament, and many are explorers. Some are artists and other artisans. So this idea, particularly you know, things like Big Bang Theory, where you have a very clever theorist doing all the clever stuff on the whiteboards, and then the experimentalists run off to their experiment to try and prove what the theorists have, that's a very small percentage of how science is done. <coughs> Most of the time in condensed matter, you're doing an experiment, and you go, oh, that's strange. That's weird. Why has it done that? And then you go and talk to your theory pals and say, we don't understand this. Can you model this for us? And instead of this theory leads experiment, or indeed experiment leads theory, the, science, the way science really works, you know this at some level, is it's a feedback loop. It's experiment couples to the theory, couples to the experiment, couples to the theory, and one refines the other. There are poet scientists 
um, philosopher scientists, and even a few mystics. I hope not. Um, this is taken directly from that um, uh, report. To an observer of science, the presence of these human elements in research raises an obvious question. Science results in knowledge that is solid and reliable as anything we know, we hope. Science and technology are among humanity's greatest achievements, having transformed not only the material conditions of our lives, but the very way in which we view the world. This is key, and this is really going to be the core, this next sentence of PPP. And if it, if it makes you uncomfortable, good. Yet scientific knowledge emerges from a process that is intensely human, a process marked by its full share of human virtues and limitations. How is the limited, fallible work of individual scientists converted into the enduring edifice of scientific knowledge? It's a great question. When do we accept that we've, this piece of information truly is um, uh, objective and truly is outside or, or biases? So one thing you should, uh, I think it might be the next slide, I'll, is it? Yeah. So one thing you shouldn't do if you haven't seen this XKCD cartoon before, you know, is the common wisdom is never read the comments. Um, the internet has always had loud, dumb people, but I've never seen anything quite as bad as the people who comment on YouTube videos. I've never seen that one before. It's worth digging it out. Um, but, but, there's always um, an alternative viewpoint. <laughs> and occasionally, it's actually worth digging into those comments because you can see a lot in terms of how large groups of people, and in this case this was 60 Symbols audience, this was a video we did on the scientific method a while ago. And in this post, this is uh, back last year, I just went through those comments because they are fascinating from the point of view, first of all it's great to be told how science works by somebody who's never done an experiment or written a scientific paper, or submitted a grant application, or seen how peer review works. It's wonderful to be told this is how it works. But this, I particularly like this comment, and lots of people like this comment, for a different reason than I did. I think we need to distinguish clearly between the messy creative process of coming up with scientific theories, a process which depends a lot on social factors and chance, versus the more system structured and systematic process of testing them, which doesn't. Horseshit. <laughs> Sorry, but that, get that idea out of your head. And all these, what is remarkable is the sort of quasi-religious aspect of this. Um, atheist or uber agnostic, depending on which way you want to, because of course it's not entirely scientific to be atheist, but I think uber agnostic is um, reasonably scientific, in that there are a million, billion, infinite number of gods that could be. Um, but this, this idea that you know we test these and we're entirely objective. I've seen, so one way of testing theories, for example, is you put a grant application in. You have a particular hypothesis or a particular theory, you put a grant application. I have seen the exactly the same grant application, because we submitted it, come at the bottom, or in the bottom quartile, of a peer review panel, and come at the top of the peer review, of a different peer review panel. The entire process of science is driven by peer review. What gets funded, what gets accepted, what gets into the literature, in terms of how science progresses, is driven by peer review. And I don't want to get you too worried. Peer review mostly works, and it does a good job. And I think the vast majority of scientists are focused on trying to do the best job they can and to be as objective as they can. But we've all got unconscious biases as well. So sometimes you can be trying to do your best, but you may not actually be aware of what biases you have. Well, that is what we normally mean by the scientific method, and then goes on to talk about graphene. But this is, this is something we're going to attack. Another great book, Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters. Um, is that really how you spell expertise? Really captures the title. It just sounds like yet another elitist appeal to authority. And you know, it would be great to think that this is a minority. You know it's not. Also, in terms of wishful thinking. So, are any of you familiar? I wasn't familiar with this until last year, so it would be great to know how many of you are. With the idea of N-rays. 
So we had X rays and gamma rays, and then in around about 1904, <coughs> uh, there was a scientist who claimed to have found something called N rays. I'll not go into the details, it was all to do with X rays being incident on spark gaps and electric fields interacting. But he claimed that these N rays were, you know, a new form of radiation, and he claimed to be able to see it, and there was an explosion of papers. There was something like 300 papers, and this was on the site of the community, it was much smaller over a century ago, claiming in the space of two years to see these wonderful N rays, and everything was meant to emit them. We were meant to emit them, trees were meant to emit them, but metal treated surfaces, or treated metal surfaces, didn't emit them, and all these wild and wacky theories about this new form of radiation. So, this guy, Robert Wood, was sent by Nature um, magazine to the laboratory of the guy who came up with an N rays, which was based in, uh, excuse my terrible French accent, Nancy, no? any N E N C Y, how do we pronounce it? Um, and hence, that's where the N in, in um, N rays came from. And he went there, and they were doing sophistic, sophisticated experiments with aluminium prisms, which they said the aluminium prisms refracted the N rays, and then on a phosphorescent screen, fluorescent screen, you could see um, the brightness get darker or lighter, or the intensity get increased or decreased depending on whether the prism was there or not, the aluminium prism. So they went in the darkened lab. This guy did a series of experiments where he removed the um, prism and said, is it getting darker or brighter? Control experiments. And the, the, there was no um, uh, observation that did better than chance. So it was scientists really, really keen to believe that there was something there that really wasn't there. I'm obliged to confess that I left the laboratory with a distinct feeling of depression, not only having failed to see a ex single experiment of convincing nature, but the almost certain conviction that all the changes in the luminosity or distinctness of sparks and phosphorescent screens, which furnish the only evidence of N-rays, are purely imaginary. And there were a range of different things that, that pop into this. One, for example, was that this was discovered in France, and a lot of French scientists got very, very keen on this because X-rays had been discovered very recently, over a few years before, in Germany. So there's a nice, interesting national competition aspect of this and in terms of pride in the sort of the national science. Range of other aspects I'm not going to go into. I'm going to instead turn to something which is a lot closer <laughs> to home and a lot closer in time. This was back about five years ago. and. This is something that is, you know, well within the nanoscience research field. And how many of you have done? How many of you have done any of the nanoscience modules? Okay, a few. For those, for the rest of you, you're going to have to think back to Frontiers, where we did scanning probe microscopy. So, which we can explain very, very quickly. Sharp probe surface. What we do is we have a feedback loop. We measure the current, and it's a tunnel current, a quantum mechanical current between the tip and the sample. And we set, set this up in a feedback loop so the current is kept constant. So as the tip is moving across, it will adjust its position to map out the topography of the surface. So there's a feedback loop in there. And the thing with feedback loops is you can make them very sensitive by driving up the gain. So what you want is to have a nice trajectory so it follows it. What you don't want is to have a really sluggish response so it crashes. On the other hand, what you also don't want is to have a very, very high rapid response to the point where what we have is something called ringing. The tip will actually oscillate because you've driven the gains and it's so sensitive to every little change that's ringing. That's what this is. That's what these stripes are. So they were imaging nanoparticles and they um, found these stripes and they got very, very excited. And instead of bending over backwards to show that actually this is a purely an instrumental artifact, they published this. And then this got published, and this is key, in a journal called Nature Materials. It's nature. Therefore, it must be right. And what happened is there were about 30 papers based on this. And you might think, well, okay, it's just like a little storm in a nanoscale teacup or whatever. But in fact, in the later papers, they made arguments that actually these stripes would be important in terms of the toxicity of nanoparticles. And if you were using them for contrast agents, for example, in, in, in for example, MRI, in terms of injecting them into the body. And once you get into that type of biomedical aspect, you've got to think about the ethical issues here. But we tried to challenge this. 
and it took a very, very long time. And still, the most recent paper from this group doesn't accept our challenge, and they go ahead and they're saying that these strike things are real, and they're still publishing papers. Now, I'm not going to get into it. They said, we said, but the question you ask yourself is, they've published in the peer-reviewed literature, we've published in the peer-reviewed literature, a critique, who's right, and who decides? And that's not an easy question. Right, reading to different papers. And you, you can see Nature Materials again, there's one in Science, um, PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's um, a pretty um, prestigious journal. Time and time again, you see these strikes. And they're an instrumental artifact. And how can I say, how can I be so you know, adamant that they're instrumental? Because we, we eventually got the raw data. And here's what you can do if you want to generate stripes. Here's nanoparticles. Here's where we've increased the, um, the feedback loop. So it rings, and you see these oscillations. And then we reduce it back down again, and you see nice clear particles. Very easy. Very any scan. It's like this is scanning probe microscopy 101. If any of you've done a third year project on STM, you can do this. The first few minutes in the lab, you can wind up your gains and you can see these stripes. Similarly, again from the scanning probe perspective, and just in terms of just because you see an image or just because you see the data in front of you does not necessarily mean that your interpretation of the data is correct. This particularly with scanning probes, particularly with this type of microscopy, and indeed with most other forms of microscopy. Just because it looks like a duck and waddles like a duck and quacks like a duck, doesn't mean it's a duck, it could be a goose. And um, here, here's a really good example. So we got incredibly excited about this. These are, you don't need to know what the molecules are, they're so simple even physicists can understand them. One, two, three, four carbon rings, one, two, three, four carbon rings. And you can see inside and you can see the overall structure. But that wasn't something we were particularly interested in because that had been shown by a um, group at IBM uh, five years earlier. What we were more interested in were these because these molecules have got oxygen and nitrogen ends and they hydrogen bond. They form a particular type of bond called a hydrogen bond, which is also the bond that's responsible for tying your DNA strands together to a large extent. And these are exactly where you'd expect to see hydrogen bonds. Absolutely exactly. And yet, and similarly, this was a paper that was published while we were ruminating over what the hell this me meant. We got scooped, and we got badly scooped, as it were. Um, in the end, I'm glad we didn't rush to publish this. This was published in Science in 2013. Again, Science is one of those top-tier, glossy journals. It is no um, exaggeration to say that for a PhD researcher or a postdoc researcher, you publish in Nature or Science, that has a huge effect in your career huge. So there's a great deal of drive towards publishing in these top tier journals. <laughs> and they, they're making the claim, again you can see these filamentary patterns, that it's, those are due to hydrogen bonds. However, about a year later, this group um, in a mixture of Poland, Polish and the German groups showed that actually what's happening there is that you're not actually seeing the charge density or the electron density related to the bonds. What you're seeing are the, I'm not going to go into the details, you're seeing the dynamics of the probe. You're seeing what happens, there's a molecule on the end of the probe, and as that molecule twists and bends, as it moves over the, the energy landscape of the molecules underneath, you see these furious features. That's what we think, and that's what the majority of the community thinks, but others think otherwise. Again, I don't want you taking all the scientific detail. I'm just asking, this is all published in the peer-reviewed literature. You've got two camps, one of whom saying this is incorrect, another smaller group in this case saying no, this is right. How do you decide? So, as I say, if you want more on that, it's in that particular post. This is, I'm gonna leave you on this. Yeah, we've only got one minute left. This is absolutely key, and we're gonna be coming back to this. There's, there's this overwhelming idea scientists used to have, I think we're getting a lot cannier, that really if we just get out there and educate people about climate change or um, vaccinations or that the earth isn't bloody flat, if we just give enough information and we just tell people, look, we'll educate you, this is, this is the way it is, look, here's the facts, here's the bloody facts, here's the evidence, 
Why won't you accept this? The reason they won't accept it is this is absolutely incredible. It's not because they're not educated enough, particularly when it comes to climate change. General education and scientific literacy do not mitigate rejection of science, but rather increase the polarization of opinions along partisan lines, particularly when it comes to climate change. The rejection of the evidence for climate change actually scales with level of education. Because particularly if you've been trained in science, in any of the sciences, we are very good at taking data in and finding holes in that data. Real holes or imagined holes. And so this idea of just educate, 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 which as an educator, I'd love if everything was simple as that. That's our mantra, that's the academic's mantra. Educate, 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 and everything will be fine. When you go over to um, the George Green Library, the, the Starbucks up on the wall, there's this statement about you know how education is the future of humanity. I really wish it were. You know, it's, um, education is exceptionally important, but education does not solve every problem. I'm going to leave it there, and that's where we're going to pick up next week. Thanks for your attention. Any questions, uh, obviously just email Omar or me. Thank you.